We are in Romans chapter 9 right now. Romans chapter 9, what we're looking at is understanding how the gospel always has been and still is God's plan for man. Now, if you, in the first century, if you were a Jew, if you had grown up learning the law of Moses, studying the law of Moses, trying to live by the law of Moses, how might you feel whenever you're suddenly now hearing the law of Moses isn't going to get you where you need to be? Be a little bit confused, and understandably, you have a little bit of a challenge right there. Because everything you've always known, everything you've thought you've always known, you're now starting to find out and learn might not have been what I thought I knew and understood. Now, there's a lot of application that can be made thinking about that for us today. There's a lot of things that we might think that we know, think that we understand, but as we gradually grow, study the Scripture more, we start to realize, well, what I thought I knew and understood <coughs> might not necessarily be what's right. Yes, the law of Moses is good and it served its purpose, and Paul has clearly illustrated that in the book of Romans. But the purpose of the law is ultimately to get us to who? Christ. To Christ. And so that's what Paul is dealing with at this point because he's trying to help uh, the Jews, especially in Romans chapter 9, understand the law is good. The law has served its purpose. They needed to understand what the purpose actually was. And rather than reject Christ, they need to do what with him? Accept him. They need to obey him. Because only in Christ we find salvation. Only in Christ we find righteousness. And that's what the Jews were looking for, what it is that they needed. <coughs> so last week we looked in, uh, in verses 1 through 5 and we saw Paul's sorrow for Israel. And that's not too long of a section there, so just as review, if somebody could go ahead and read for us Romans chapter 9 verses 1 through 5. I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bear me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ, my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh, who are Israelites who pertain, or to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers, and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. And so there we see how Paul again is directly addressing uh, the Jews. He's directly addressing the Israelites at this point. Uh, last week, uh, Jesse Moser and I were talking a little bit after class. Uh, he had asked a question in there about kind of who specifically this is being addressed to. Because, of course, if you go back to the beginning of the book of Romans... It's being written to the Christians. That's Romans chapter 1, verse 6, verse 7 right there. So we're writing to the Christians. There was a problem at that time between Jew and Gentile relations. But at this point in Romans chapter 9, and I think it bears out more, especially in chapter 10, it's almost as if Paul is, is more broadly now addressing the Jews as a whole, addressing, human, addressing humanity as a whole. The reason that seems to be is because you look in these five verses, well, he's dealing with the people who have rejected Jesus Christ, ultimately. And so if they've rejected Christ, they can't really be Christians. And same thing when you get to chapter 10 and verse 1, in the same overall context, you see where it is that Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. And so it's almost as if Paul is writing to uh, his Jewish brethren that were Christians talking to them how to address the Jewish brethren that were not yet Christians, teaching a broader lesson about the saving power of the gospel because the gospel is and always has been God's plan. And so now let's look in verses 6 to 13 as it relates to God's promise. Somebody go ahead and read verses 6 through 13 out of Romans chapter 9 for us. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise and are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. 
At this time I will come, and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac. For the children not yet being born, not nor having done any good or evil, that they might purpose of God according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, The older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So in this section, we're talking about the promise of God. Ultimately getting to the Messiah, talking about the plan that God has always had through Jesus Christ in order to save man. So think back if you are a Jew in the first century, you've always known the law, you've always tried to live by the law, and now you're learning something new about the gospel. Well, understandably in our minds, if that's where we are, we'd be sitting here thinking, what about all those promises that God made to our father Abraham? What about all the promises he made to us being his children, being his special, his chosen people? We might be sitting here thinking, well, what does that mean? And does that mean that all those promises are not true anymore? Well, Paul can understand why we'd be thinking that way. Because he himself at one time was thinking that way. So he says there, when you look back up in verse 6, it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. He's essentially answering that question or that thought that might be in the mind of those Jews in the first century. Now, of course, New King James here saying uh, the word of God has taken no effect. Uh, some other translations make it a little more clear, and they basically say it's not as though the word of God has failed. In other words, um, it's not as if the promises of God haven't come true. It's not that they don't still come true. Paul is making sure these, under, or these individuals understand God's promises still ring true today. He promised it then. It's still going, or he's still going to uphold it uh, even now. His plan has not gone wrong. And that's important to understand too. Uh, because there, there are those who have you know, made contentions through the years that uh, because the Jews rejected Jesus, then essentially the church was a plan B after that. Uh, that the, the goal and the hope was always for the Jews to go ahead and accept Jesus as the Messiah at that time. He'd be able to become king. But because they didn't follow through with God's plan, essentially, they would say, well, that's why Jesus ends up being crucified, he's resurrected, and now we have the church. Is that the case? No. That's far from the truth. And Paul is pointing out in this section that it's all about God's promise, and God's promise has stood, uh, has stood true all the way up to the point of the church. And uh, God's promise has always been for both Jew and Gentile to be one in the church. And so that's really what we're looking at in the entirety of the section in chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. And so Paul then, in order to help uh, get to this point, he says at the end of verse 6, "...for they are not all Israel." Who, of Israel, who are of Israel. Nor are they all children, verse 7, because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, he says, your seed shall be called. What, what does this mean? It almost seems like it means like they're not all of Israel now because it's for everybody and but not even everybody who's an Israelite is going to be saved even though you're the seed of Abraham. It doesn't matter anymore. Exactly. Not all who are of the seed, not all who are Israelites physically are going to be of spiritual Israel. Just because one was physically an Israelite did not make him what really mattered to be an Israelite. Now we'll make some more application on this as we continue through. But that's an important verse to understand right there, especially as it relates to uh, some other thoughts that are there in the religious world concerning Israel and how God is going to redeem and save all of Israel on top of everything else. Well, understand what Paul is saying. Not all of Israel are of Israel. If you're a Jew in the first century, again, put yourself in those shoes, you're probably going to uh, react in one of two ways. 
At this point, you're either going to go ahead and put the wall up and you're going to say, I can't listen to anything else you have to say. Uh, I'm an Israelite. I know I'm an Israelite. Or you're going to say, that's interesting. What do you, what do you mean by that? And Paul is explaining this, and he does so in a very uh, good way because he's continually pointing back to the Old Testament scriptures. Yes, sir. And that's the key. And that's the way it's been from all the way from from the beginning to now to Christ. Right. That Christ was through faith in in, in the will of God. Uh, everyone would would be faith. Yeah, that that faith is key in it. Like you say, he had to come to faith in order to be saved. Be saved. And even you go back into Romans chapter four. And uh, look at Abraham there and everything as it relates to the seed and the promise being of faith. <clears throat> faith has always been the way. It's just a matter of that the Israelites had at some point lost the right faith. Uh, they started to work on, on uh, achieving righteousness for themselves. And that's something else that comes up uh, in this particular section once we get to the end of it with Jacob and Esau. They hadn't done anything. Uh, there was no working they did in and of themselves in order to be righteous. And what we'll see as we get there is that that teaches a, a, an important lesson. And so relating to then Israel, not all of Israel, uh, not all who are of Israel are of Israel. That's kind of a mouthful whenever you're trying to get that out. Anyway, uh, the point that Paul is making, you keep looking in verse 7 like Candy mentioned. Just because they're not of the physical seed, or just because they are of the physical seed does not mean that they will be of the spiritual. Like Alvin points out, it doesn't mean that just because they're an Israelite, they're seeking it by faith. You've got to be looking, you've got to be following it, seeking it in the right way. You look at what it is uh, related to the physical that we see here. The end of verse 7, what is it that Paul quotes? Yeah, Genesis 21, 12, and Isaac, your seed shall be called. Did Abraham have any other children? Yeah, Ishmael. Ishmael. You look a little bit later once you get into, uh, what is it, Genesis chapter 25, and you find uh, of, uh, of another son there by Keturah. And so Abraham had more children than just Isaac. But where was the seed of promise coming from? Isaac. From Isaac. So just because someone is a son of Abraham, I mean, even the Gentiles could claim Abraham as a father. But the only son that the promise would come through was who? Isaac. Isaac. And so just to be a child of Abraham doesn't necessarily mean anything. Paul's showing here, you got to follow God's plan. you got to be a son of Isaac. But just to be a son of Isaac is not enough. Because if you keep looking in the section, uh, what do we find? You keep looking in verse 8. Paul's explaining it all. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as the seed. So still here talking about Isaac. Verse 9, he says, this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And so this is still related to Isaac. But what Paul is showing, a promise was made. And so a couple of different places possibly that that particular quote in verse 9 could have come from. Uh, if you're taking notes, you can write down Genesis 17:21, Genesis 18:10, and Genesis 18 verse 14. And so that, that's a couple of different places perhaps that particular quote may have come from. But it's all getting to uh, the understanding that Isaac was the son of promise, not Ishmael. Not a son from another concubine, but only through Isaac. But it has to be a part of God's plan. So that's why when we come down into uh, verse 10, verse 10 we see not only this, so not only is this connected then to being a son of Isaac, the promise coming through Isaac, but also he says, When Rebekah had conceived by one man, 
even by our father Isaac. So even by the one who is the son of promise here. He says, For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, The older shall serve the younger. Now, again, New King James here, and even King James, this is a, a pretty big sentence, and it's kind of easy to lose what exactly is being said. Because you look at verse 11, and verse 11 there is just a parenthetical. So it's uh, just some additional information to help us understand the particular sentence. But you take the parenthetical out, and you're looking then at just verse, four, or excuse me, verse uh, 10 and verse 12 to see the, the bigger picture of what actually is being said in the sentence. Then we'll come back to verse 11. But verse 10, And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, verse 12, it was said to her, The older shall serve the younger. Well, the Jews understood as soon as he says Rebekah, conceived by one man Isaac, they already know in their minds, okay, we're talking about Jacob and Esau. Well, Jacob and Esau, we usually always put Jacob first, but was Jacob the oldest? No. Esau was the firstborn of the twins, and then Jacob. Now, logically in our minds, we would think, okay, if Isaac is the one through whom the seed of promise would come, we would think logically, which of the two sons would the seed come through? Through Esau, through the firstborn. But is that what God said it would be? No. That's why in verse 12, in order to show that point, he quotes the, uh, the scripture there to say, the older shall serve the younger. Now that particular quote is coming from uh, Genesis chapter 25, verses 22 and 23. And, and some have said concerning that, well, you never actually see Esau serving Jacob. But there's a bigger picture to this. It's not about the individuals, but it's more about the nations. From Esau, what nation do we find? The Edomites. Of course, then from Jacob, we continue to see the Israelites. Well, by the time you get into the days of the kings, especially even in the days of King David, what we find is that the Edomites are now serving the Israelites. They're paying tribute to the Israelites. They're helping work for them, essentially. And so we see, well, the promise came true. It wasn't about the individuals, but now we're looking at a bigger picture of the nations. Even verse 13, it says, As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, looking in that, that can be a little bit uh, of a, a jarring quote to think about. And if we try to at least, uh, if we try to kind of dodge around the fact, that can be a little bit surprising whenever we think about this is God who's saying, Jacob I've loved, Esau I've hated. We're not really being honest with the text. Now there's not an issue with what's being said there. Of course, there's a matter of it being Jacob I have loved more, Esau I have loved less. But you've got to look at the purpose of the quote. Why is Paul bringing this in? What is the point that Paul is making? Jacob would be the one through whom the seed of promise would come. It's not that God, uh, you know, just banished the Edomites and said, I'm not going to have anything to do with y'all. Well, matter of fact, you look in the book of Obadiah and there's a message directly to the Edomites that there's a need for them to repent. So understand, God still had a desire for them to do what is right. But in the purpose of what's being said, it's to show the Israelites God has done everything for them. God loves them. God gave them special favor that he gave to no other nation simply because of who their father is. But did the Israelites really uh, respect that? Because neither one ultimately respected God. 
leave them, they left God. Right. And, and the point, well, and within that, you see how, like you mentioned, in time, God brings about the Messiah through the Israelites, but the Israelites had already rejected God. God was going to ultimately have to give the Israelites up. Now, God's promise was not so much for the people of Israel as it was to bring about the Messiah, because God's plan has always been the same plan. It's interesting, too, whenever we look at it, because like you mentioned in that, well, God rejects the Edomites the same way he ultimately rejects the Israelites. But where is it that we find the quote that Paul does in verse 13? We don't find it back in Genesis 25 or in any text related specifically to Jacob and Esau. Instead, we find it in the very last book of the Old Testament. We find it in the book of Malachi, which is essentially a last-ditch effort to say, y'all need to get things right. You need to straighten up. That's how the book of Malachi begins. Malachi 1, 2, and 3 is where we find that quote, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. A reminder there to the Israelites to say, think about the blessings that God has given you. Think about the special interest he has taken in you. If you know how much he loves you, if you know all that he has done for you, how can you keep living the way you're living? How can you not, going back to Alvin's point earlier, submit to him in faith and ultimately see at this point in the first century how the Messiah has come from you? People look at it through the wrong lens because God loved the Edomites too because the Messiah was just as much for the Edomites as he was the Jews mm -hmm. and everyone else. Mm -hmm. So he showed, you know, again, we misapply the, the statement in that verse <coughs> look at, uh, that God hated him. No, he, he loved them. He loved the Edomites dearly just like he loved Israelites. It was just that through, through the Israelites, the Messiah would come, come through the Israelites, not through the Edomites. But like you say, the Messiah was for the Edomites just as he was for the Israelites. Yes, ma'am. Um, do some translations say loved less? Um, That's what I've always understood that it was. Not, I don't know that any translation specifically says that. Um, I, I tried to actually look into that some, and not to say it's not there for the meaning in the Old Testament, but at least under the New Testament, whenever you get into some of the passages Jesus gives as far as uh, to hate your mother, your father, brother, sister, there was a first century kind of Greek mindset in that of meaning love less, but I couldn't find anything specifically on the Hebrew for that. So I did try to look at it, not to say it's not there, I just... And, you know, the little bit of study I did on it, I, I didn't come across it myself. But I have, heard, I have heard others say it. I just haven't seen it for myself. And so. I think that's kind of what your dad's saying, that he, of course he loved them because the Bible tells us he loves everyone, you know. Right. And so it can't mean a good word like we think of the word hate. Yes, right. Because even, even as Paul uses it here in Romans chapter 9, well, by the time we get to Romans chapter 11... What Paul is saying is the gospel was for you Israelites, but it's also for the Gentiles, even those who would have been these Edomites. And so it's still getting to the point that God's plan has always been through the gospel. But we haven't talked about verse 11 yet. And so we might think, okay, God has chosen the Israelites. He chose um, Jacob because of something that he did. And that's why he rejected Esau, because of something that Esau did. But what does verse 11 tell us? It's, he, he chose them not because of what? Yeah. Nothing that they did. It was just part of his plan. Yeah. They, they hadn't done anything. They hadn't been born yet. They hadn't done good or they hadn't done evil. That's a, a good point to bring out as well here because there are those who would say, well, even a, an unborn baby, even a baby themselves, well, when they're born, they have this sin in their life and all that needs to be taken care of immediately. Well, you look right here and what's it say? They've not done good. They've not done evil. Uh, nothing that they did influenced God's, uh, God's choosing here. 
God simply chooses Jacob over Esau as a way to show that it would not be of works, but of him who calls. Yes. It flips. Right. Again, you, we would expect it to be Esau who would be the one through whom the seed would come. But instead, it's through Jacob. Yeah, it's not, it's not about being the firstborn son. It's not about uh, what we would expect or think it to be. But it's about what God says it will be. God was showing from the very beginning of the plan, all the way back in the book of Genesis, this isn't going to happen the way we think or we expect it to, but it's going to come about how God says it will. Again, nothing that they did influenced God's decision, but God is the one who is able to make that decision. It's not of works, but of him who calls. And so let's, uh, let's keep looking, and let's move into the next part here, verses 14 to 29 as it relates to God's righteousness. So moving into this particular section, we would think, okay, um, how is that even fair? They hadn't done anything, and God is now choosing the younger over the older. Uh, why is it that God can say, well, now you who once were uh, my chosen, my special people, are no longer necessarily my chosen or special people? How is that even right? Somebody go ahead and read for us verses 14. Uh, just go ahead and read verses 14 down through verse 18. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whomever or whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. So right here we're looking at, at an example of God's righteousness back to the days of Moses. So basically Paul's just kind of working his way through Israelite history. And when he gets to this point, he says, verse 14, is there unrighteousness with God? And, of course, the answer is no. He tells us certainly not. The way he shows that there is no unrighteousness with God, that what he is doing is right, that he has the right to be able to choose through whom his seed would come. Again, that's important to remember that we're talking about bringing about Christ Jesus, not talking about salvation specifically, but how salvation would come. You look in verses 15 and 16, and we see what he says to Moses. I'll have mercy on whomever I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. This is a quote going back to Exodus chapter 33 and verse 19. Exodus 33 verse 19, it, this is after we've already seen the golden calf incident. And you would think how it is at this point, okay, well, uh, you know, how can you bring these people out and then how can you punish them for what they've done, but then you still want to continue to show them the mercy? How can all of this be? Moses goes back up on the mountain. Moses asks to see God's glory. All of these things going on, Exodus chapter 33. God tells Moses, I'm going to show mercy to who I'm going to show mercy. I'm going to have compassion on whoever I will have compassion. And so, verse 16, Paul is explaining what this means to us. It's not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of who? But of God who shows mercy. Now, not being of him who wills means it's not what any of us want. It's not what any of us desire. It's not what any of us wish. We all would want and wish and desire for God to show us his mercy. But is want and will and wish and desire enough? No. That doesn't make a difference. God's going to show mercy on whomever he's going to show mercy. He's going to show compassion on whomever he's going to show compassion. But what about him who runs? 
What about one who's willing to do some like ridiculous feat and they're going to go run uh, you know, an ultra marathon and in the process they're going to run up a mountain and when they get to the top of the mountain they're going to do 65 jumping jacks and then they're going to do like 28 burpees and they're going to do all their push-ups and they're going to do all of these things. Then when they get back home, well, you know what? The ultra marathon's done, but they're going to keep running because if they keep running, they might be able to get God's mercy. Is it of him who runs? It doesn't matter what we wish, want, or do, or desire. In the end, it really doesn't matter what it is that we do, what our actions are. Mercy's up to who? It's up to God. Now, God has shown us through his word how we can obtain his mercy. Paul's already laid out in the book of Romans that the way we can obtain the mercy of God is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's because that is God's plan. Not anything that we do not anything that we desire. And that's even how it was going back in the days of the Old Testament. It's all about who it is, or it's all about God's determination and not man's determination. And to, you know, further that point, we look at verse 17. Verse 17, now who are we seeing the Scripture talking to? To Pharaoh. So still looking in the days of the Exodus, you still got Moses. Now we're looking at the Pharaoh. And to the Pharaoh, what is said? God raised him up for the purpose of being a king. God's the one who raised him up. Pharaoh is going to serve God's purpose so that God's name can be declared to all the earth. Interesting little tidbit side note there. You look in verse 17, and what does Paul say, or who does Paul say is speaking? The scripture. Well, the scripture is very clearly God's word. Uh, that's just something interesting there that we can, we can note. Uh, Jared? We'll say the uh, <coughs> omniscience of God plays a big factor in a lot of what's being said here. Yes. Him, you know, the heart of man and how they will respond in situations. It has a lot to do, a lot of bearing on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, God, God knowing, uh, knowing man, like you say, knowing the heart of man. And that's, uh, we'll, we'll kind of hit on that again here in just a second. Because when we think especially about Pharaoh, and we look at what it is, generally when we think about Pharaoh and the Exodus, we think about Moses saying, let my people go. Pharaoh saying, I'm not letting the people go. And when Pharaoh's not letting the people go, what's the phrase that we see time and time again? It's hardened his heart. Now, sometimes we see it's Pharaoh who hardened his heart. Sometimes we see where it says God is the one that hardened his heart. In fact, if we look in verse, uh, verse 18, Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and to whom he wills he hardens. That's God showing the mercy. That's God doing the hardening. Now back to Jared's point. God being all-knowing, knowing the heart of man... If God is the one who is showing mercy, if he's the one who is uh, hardening the hearts, does that eliminate our choice? Yes. Why not? We all have free will. And so if you understand it to mean that, then you're, just, you're misunderstanding it because he's not going to not give somebody a choice to follow him. He doesn't right. know what actions come about. He already knows how you're going to respond. You're either going to be pricked in your heart or you're going to be hardened. And that has nothing to do with him. It has everything to do with you. He just already knows what you're going to do. Right. We still have the choice. We still have the decision to make. Like we mentioned there with Pharaoh, uh, sometimes we see explicitly where it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, even going back into the account of the Exodus. But there are times specifically where we see it say that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Uh, we could look, if you're taking notes, Exodus chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Exodus 7, verses 13 and 14. Exodus chapter 8, verse 15, as well as Exodus chapter 8, verse 32, and then also Exodus chapter 9, verse 34. And so in those particular verses, we see very clearly Pharaoh hardened his own heart. That's because of his own stubbornness. That's because of the way that he was rejecting what it is that God desired for him to do. But even in that, God's plan was still coming about. God's plan ultimately to get to the Messiah was still coming about. Even though man thought he was doing something uh, for himself. In hardening his own heart and in not letting the people of Israel go, 
Pharaoh would have thought he's showing the strength of his own arm. But whose, uh, whose strength was he actually showing? God's. Nobody would have seen that coming. Yet through it all, the power of God is known and shown. Think about even years down the road, by the time the children of Israel come into the land, uh, or the promised land, and how it's even in the promised land that people knew about what God did back in Egypt. It wasn't about what Pharaoh did, it was about what God did. And so God's strength was shown very clearly. God's the one who had the right to show the mercy to the Israelites uh, compared to uh, what it is and the hardening he did in the Egyptians, essentially. All because, through the Israelites, who was going to come? Jesus Christ. Through the Israelites, not through the Egyptians. Paul? start to uh, we start to, to try to think things through too much for ourselves uh, try to rely on our own knowledge or understanding or what we what we think is right what we think the plan would be when we're missing God's plan all along uh, they're, they're going to be they're doing wrong so so they'll get there God will punish them in the end that's that's the opposite of what God wants us to right do. he wants us to go after them yeah it's the complete wrong mindset there uh, did you have something, Jamie? Yeah, uh, I'm gonna get too far off base, but um, going off of that, I think when we see the the Israelites around this time and before and, and earlier in the church, they're very very focused on having God's favor, like mm -hmm. we're God's special people. Abraham's our father, all this kind of stuff. And um, we see time and time again, you know, even John the Baptist is, is telling them God can make stones, you know, Abraham's seed. Like it doesn't matter. Um, so, and it seems, especially in the Old Testament, it seems to us probably very, very unfair, you know, the Israelites were so favored, and, mm -hmm. you know, God, you know, all the other nations didn't have his favor, but we're focusing on the Israelites, they had God's favor, and they, you know, they didn't even follow him. Right. They chose to not follow him, but... Having God's favor wasn't the point. You could still choose to follow God even if you don't have God's favor. Guys, that's kind of the point today, too. Um, mm -hmm. We could maybe think of us as Christians, like we're in God's favor. We know the truth. We learn the truth. Even go as far as to say that those of us that were born into the church are we're maybe a little bit luckier, you know. We have God's favor easier maybe than others. But having that, having God's favor so easy isn't the point. It's, yeah. it's going and teaching others and having them learn, like, be, learn how to be in God's mm -hmm. favor, I guess, if that makes any yeah. sense at all. It's just because you're in the right place doesn't mean you're in the right place. Right. You can think back to verse 6, not all who are of Israel are of Israel. And to the, you know, the application you bring out there, just because we might be in the church of Christ doesn't necessarily mean that we're a Christian. You got to be doing the right thing. You got to be living the right way. You've got to make sure you're following God's plan and not 
your own version of God's plan. Um, a little bit of homework, just something if you want to uh, think through until our next class. You'll see when we get towards the end of the chapter, in, uh, starting in <laughs> verse 25, there are three different quotes. You got one quote from Hosea, and that's going to come from Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. And then another quote from Hosea in verse 26. That's Hosea chapter 1, verse 10. And then you get down into 27, and you have some quotes from Isaiah, verse 29, some more from Isaiah. And uh, you can kind of go back and look through those quotes and see if you can figure out who that's specifically referring to. And I think that if we can understand who those are specifically referring to being applied to, it's going to drive this point home even further once we get to the end of the chapter. And so we'll uh, stop there for this morning, and Lord willing, pick up in verse uh, 19 next week.